lifts us and helps us. I'm so grateful for that. Thank you for being here today. We're worshiping you.
you're in this place this morning and you just need to feel the strength of the Lord, just fix your hearts, fix your eyes, just worship. Even when it hurts to worship, just give him that praise and that worship and you will find strength in his presence this morning. He is worthy. He is holy. He is awesome.
this morning, uh, I just want to take a look for a few minutes uh, at the, the book of Nehemiah, the man Nehemiah. Um, and, and like we've said a lot this year, this is the year of stepping out, uh, where God is going to pour into us and uh, empower us and strengthen us to step out and do what he's called us to do. Um, if, we, if we look at some of the things that Nehemiah did, it's, it doesn't take uh, too long to see that, that when God gave him a job to do, he did exactly that. Uh, he stepped out and he did uh, impossible things by man's standards. Um, but it wasn't always smooth sailing for Nehemiah. He faced opposition. He faced opposition uh, from enemies. He faced opposition even from, from his fellow Jews uh, when they complained why things couldn't be done. Um, but, but if we, we look a little bit at history uh, leading up to, to Nehemiah, uh, his story begins in, in the, the middle of the 5th century B.C. Uh, at this point in history, the Israelites uh, have been taken into exile by the Babylon, Babylonian Empire. Uh, for 70 years, uh, Jeremiah prophesied that that would happen. And um, during that exile, King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, when he would go in and take over a, a nation, he would take all the young and the brightest men, and he would put them to work in the, in the, in the castle. Um, they would be his servants, and uh, whoever he didn't kill, he would either take as slaves, um, and then he would always leave a remnant uh, in each city uh, of the poorest of people, just to be the farmers, take care of the vineyards, and stuff like that. Um, so after about... Uh, about 50 years after Babylon destroyed Jerusalem, the Persian Empire comes in and, and, and defeats the Babylonian Empire, and King Cyrus takes over. Uh, and King Cyrus did things a little different. He, he started allowing uh, people to go back to their land, uh, people that, that the Babylonian Empire had, had captured. And uh, he began to, to let some of the nations go back uh, a little bit to where, uh, where they came from. So, so Jews began to return to Jerusalem uh, right around 536 B.C., um, it's during this time that, that Nehemiah was born. He was born in exile. Uh, we don't know much about his early life, uh, but somehow he works his way up the corporate ladder uh, in service to the king. And, and the Bible says that he becomes the cupbearer to the king. Um, so if we look at the job of cupbearer, uh, the cupbearer, his job was to serve the royal wine at the royal table to the king and, and his family. And, and uh, being a cupbearer cup was, was very honorable. It was a very uh, noble job, and, and they cons were considered to be one of the highest-ranking servants in the king's home. Um, this was because, uh, you know, as we can see, we, we've seen in movies and stuff like that, people were always out to take the king's throne. Um, and one of the ways they did that back then, you know, we, they didn't have, you know, you know, guns and assassins and stuff like that. So they thought they would be sneaky, and they would poison the king. So the cupbearer's job was to guard the wine with his life. To guard, the, to, to guard that with his life, to make sure the king didn't get poisoned. Um, and there were even times that, that the cupbearer would even have to taste the wine, drink the wine in, in the king's presence to prove that it wasn't poison. And of course, if it, if it was, the cupbearer would die. Um, so, uh, so you can imagine how closely the cupbearer uh, would guard that wine uh, and how much the king had to trust who, the cup, who uh, his cupbearer was. Um, it was a serious responsibility, and whoever held this position had to be trustworthy. Had, they had to be loyal. And that's exactly who Nehemiah was. Uh, so one day, as, as Nehemiah's uh, uh, working, he's in the, the castle, a group of Jews came back from Judah uh, to, to Susa, which was where Nehemiah lived. It was in modern-day Iran, um, and that's where the king's home was. And, ne and Nehemiah asked, you know, how Jerusalem's going? How, how's it going there? Um, and this was their answer in Nehemiah 1, verses 3 and 4. Uh, they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And when, when Nehemiah heard the, the news about, about Jerusalem and his, his nation, his heart was broken. And it was broken the condition of Jerusalem, and, and he worried about the safety of the people, uh, his fellow Israelites who had gone back to live there. And, and he knew he had to do something. He, he couldn't just sit around and let it happen. Um, many times the causes in the ministries that we give our attention to, uh, they come from a broken heart. They come from a heart that, that, that we, you know, weeps over the situation, and, and we know we, we have to do something about it. Um, if, if we look in the scripture, David's heart was broken. When Goliath stepped on the battlefield and, 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 and degraded his nation and his God, David's heart was broken. He couldn't believe anybody, you know, nobody would stand up, so he, he said, I'll do it. And victory came when he stepped out. To stand for that cause. And when, when I think about something breaking our hearts, I, I think about the Harrises. I think about Joy, uh, Wendy and, and Jeff. And, and they went on a mission trip a couple years ago. And they visited a dump when, where all these kids are just born into poverty. 
And they knew, it, I mean, with their hearts broken, they knew they had to do something about it. And they're still collecting cans and sending money to, to these kids to get them out of that poverty situation, to break the cycle that their family is in. And they, they, they don't do it for, for, for their own glory. They don't do it to be seen, but they do it because their heart was broken at what they saw. And it still affects them to this day. We have to find out what breaks our hearts. Uh, the best way to find out what, what breaks our heart is to see what breaks God's heart. And all through scripture, we can look at, at, at things that break God's heart. And in Genesis 6, verses 5 through 6, uh, it reads, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So we can see that wickedness breaks God's heart. His heart was grieved that all of creation, the Bible says, that was full of evilness all the time, full of wickedness. Evil and ungodliness fill God's pain, heart with pain. God said this through, through the prophet Jeremiah in, in Jeremiah 23, 9 through 11. It says, concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me. All my bones tremble, and I'm like a drunken man, like a strong man overcome by wine because of the Lord and his holy words. And the land is full of adulterers because the curse of the land lies parched. And the pastures in the wilderness are withered. The prophets follow an evil course and use their power unjustly. Both prophets and priests are godless. Even in my temple I find their wickedness, declares the Lord. So again, we can see that God's heart is broken, and this time it's for his chosen people and the leaders who aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, and really, you can look at the Bible, and all throughout history, uh, God pours his love out on people, his special creation made in his image. And, and, and we can see all throughout the Bible this, this talk about a marriage relationship that God wants with us. He calls himself the bride. He calls us, or he calls us the bride and himself the bridegroom. And, and the Bible says that he's coming for a pure and spotless bride. And there's, there's, all throughout the Bible, there's this marriage talk. It, it, for example, 2 Corinthians 11, 2, uh, God says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband, to Christ, that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. In Ephesians 25, 25 through 27, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. And then we see the, the, the final destination of the wedding ceremony in Revelation 19.7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. So we can see this marriage relationship all through scripture really. That God wants uh, to have a, 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 that, that close, intimate relationship with us. And, and in, in Jeremiah 23, God looks at mankind and he sees his bride. And he sees, he, he says that the man has committed adultery. And it breaks his heart. He, see, he sees how his, his bride, how us, his special, his special uh, creation it has committed adultery with the world by giving ourselves over to the world's way of living and the world's way of thinking. And he loves us so much that it breaks his heart. In Luke 19, Jesus rides down uh, the Mount of Olives on, on the donkey, and, and as he looks at the city of Jerusalem, he begins to weep for it. And we can read in Luke 19, verses 41 through 44, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, even if you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side, and they will dash you to the ground. You and the children within the walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And Jesus, when, when, he, when he knew what was about to happen, he knew that, that, that his people were going to turn on him. His heart was broken that, that they hadn't accepted him. He knows these same people who are throwing palm branches before him are the same people in a few hours are going to be crying out, crucify him. And his heart is in anguish that his creation has rejected him. Another thing that breaks God's heart, we, we can see it in, in Ephesians 4, is, is strife between believers. Uh, in verses 29 through 32, it says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may be benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Just, just as in Christ, God forgave you. 
So we're not supposed to grieve the Holy Spirit. It breaks his, it breaks his heart when, when there's uh, distress between us. That word grieve in the, in the Greek is lupeo. And it means to distress or to make sad or to cause heaviness or sorrow. And, and when we tear one another down instead of building one another up, um, when we're bitter towards one another, when, when we argue and fight and slander against one another, these things break God's heart. Because we're supposed to be loving and showing kindness and, and compassion to one another. We're supposed to extend that same forgiveness that God has shown us to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we don't, it grieves the Holy Spirit. So looking at all these times in Scripture where, where God's heart is broken, we can see that there's one common denominator in all of it. And that's us. Every time God's heart is broken, it's because of us. It's for us. His heart is broken when we're broken. His heart is broken when we're hurt. And, and, and his heart is broken when mankind who has made in his image just doesn't want to have a relationship with him. And it breaks his heart. So if we want our hearts to break uh, for that same thing that God that breaks God's hearts, uh, all we have to do is look around us. If we want to step out to accomplish God's plan, look around and find someone who's hurting. Find someone who's broken or in need or, in, or lost and doesn't know the Lord. And that, that's exactly what ne Nehemiah did. He saw a need. He, he, he heard about the walls that were torn down. He heard that his fellow Jews uh, were, were not safe. And um, we know that the city walls were meant to keep the enemy out and to keep the residents safe inside. And, and with no wall, neither was possible. And it broke Nehemiah's heart. And he knew he had to do something about it. So if we look throughout Nehemiah, the first thing that Nehemiah did was the, was the most important thing that we, ha that we have to do before we do anything. And that's pray. In Nehemiah 1.4, uh, Nehemiah says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. And for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah knew that before uh, anything could be done, uh, it had to be God's plan. It, there was no way that he could go and ask the king uh, you know, to let one of his top officials, one of his most trusted people, to be allowed to leave for the purpose of rebuilding the enemy city. It was an impossible circumstance, but, but Nehemiah knew that God was, was he, he makes impossible things possible. So he prayed and he asked for direction, and he asked for guidance, and he continued to pray, really, if you read the book of Nehemiah, throughout the whole uh, experience, through whole, the whole process of rebuilding these walls, Nehemiah prayed over and over and over again. He prayed when he went to the king to ask permission to go uh, to Jerusalem. And it, like I said, this was a big deal. He, he was one of the king's most trusted men. He protected the king from people who wanted to kill him. And now he's asking to leave. And as Nehemiah prayed, he was encouraged by God. And, and, and he not only asked to leave, but he asked for letters of protection. Because he knew that there would be enemies uh, out there as he traveled through the territories to get to Jerusalem. And not only did he ask for protection, he asked for lumber from the royal forest. To help re rebuild the walls and city gates. And the king heard his request and said, sure, go to it. And if we think about this, think about this whole situation. A foreigner born in exile allowed to go back and rebuild the city that that, that that nation destroyed. That should not happen. And not only does he want the king's blessing to go, he wants the king to pay for it. And the king says, sure, go to it. I mean, that, that just shouldn't happen. But Nehemiah prayed for God's will. He, he prayed to make sure God was in it. And he followed God's call. And, and what seemed impossible was, was suddenly possible. And Nehemiah knew that God had worked it all out. In ne Nehemiah 2.8, uh, the, the last verse, or the last sentence of that verse says, And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. Nehemiah knew that God had worked it all out. It was nothing that he did. It was all God. If we look throughout the book of Nehemiah, 11 times there's recorded in the book of Nehemiah that, that Nehemiah prayed uh, to seek God uh, sometime during this rebuilding process. Some, some of the prayers are long. Um, in fact, the longest prayer recorded in Scripture is found in Nehemiah chapter 9. Uh, some of his prayers are short. Even a couple of them are even just one sentence where he just, just prays uh, quietly to himself. Some were prayed out loud in front of people. Some were by himself uh, quietly. Some were uh, so they, they would find favor as they worked. Um, and some were just to thank God for everything that he had done. But we, but we could see that Nehemiah was a constant man of prayer. He, he prayed continually because he knew that God was in control. He knew that God had everything worked out. And he knew that all he had to do was seek God's heart and follow his will. David also knew how important it was to pray. Uh, he trusted God to do the same thing for him in Psalms 116, uh, 1 and 2. He says, I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. 
I will call on him as long as I live. Samuel knew the same thing in his farewell speech in 1 Samuel 12, 23. Samuel said, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. Think about it. When we, when we fail to pray for our brother and sister in Christ, Samuel says it's sin. He says, he says if I'm not praying for my brother and sister, I'm sinning. Samuel knew how important it was to pray. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray continually. Don't ever stop. Just pray always. Always have an attitude of prayer. So prayer has to be the first step in anything and everything we do. And, and we can't stop praying as we can continue to walk out and do what God's called us to do. We have to continue in that prayer as God leads us and, uh, to do the impossible. And if you think about it, prayer is really the power and the, the driving force be, be behind all ministry. It has to be started out in prayer. So we have to pray. The, the second step Nehemiah took was that he came up with a plan. So he prayed, he came up with a plan, and, and, he, and, and really, it, I've seen people throughout my course of life um, in, in, in ministry, um, and they try to do great things for God, but they never really had a plan. They kind of won it. And I've got to admit, I, 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 I've done this before, too. <laughs> you get a little lazy, you just think, oh, I can do this, and you just kind of wing it. Um, and uh, very rarely did it ever succeed to, to where it could have been. You know, there's been times where it worked out that, you know, things, we got to the end goal, um, but they didn't quite work out the way, uh, as well as it could have been if we had a plan. Um, we have to have a plan in order to succeed in anything. Um, and I was thinking about this, I, I was actually thinking about Bill. He's a builder. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought, you know, what would it look like if, if Bill called up Lowe's and said, hey, I'm building a house. Send me some stuff. And then just waited and. And I'm sure they would ask, well, what do you want us to send? I don't care. Just send stuff. I'll build it. You know, well, okay. Well, we'll just send you some house stuff. That'll be, you know, $80,000. Well, I don't have any money. You know, where's the plan at in that? We, you know, we have to have this plan. You know, I don't know what that house would look like, but it'd be an adventure, I guess, to build with whatever they bring. <laughs> but, uh, but we would probably all guess that it might not be a real nice house. You know, we have to have a plan. We have to have a goal. We have to have something to work towards and a, 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 a blueprint for what it looks like. Jesus talked about this in Luke 14, verses 28 through 32. He says, suppose, if you want, who, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you and say this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or that, suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. So when God gives us something to do, we have to consider the cost. We have to come up with a plan. We have to, to say, all right, what do we need to do to, to accomplish what God's called us to do? We just can't, we just can't wing it. And, you know, I've heard some, some people say, yeah, i got to work it out. You know, and that's true. God can do that. But, you know. It's a whole lot easier when, when we're working with God to build that plan, to, to work towards it. Um, Nehemiah understood this. When the king let him go to, to, to rebuild these walls, he, he knew there would be opposition. He knew that was coming. So he said, all right, I need a plan. I need some letters. Give me some letters to the governors to, to let them know I got safe passage. And he knew he'd need materials. So, so he thought, hey, you know, my plan, I, we, we, need, we need some stuff, king. You, you let us have some wood and, and materials and and, and Nehemiah understood this. Um, so, and even, even with these things, Nehemiah still didn't have much of an idea of what needed to be done. So when he got to Jerusalem, um, the Bible says a, a night or two after he got there, he actually got on a horse. And he, and he went around the city after everyone had gone to bed. And he just surveyed the wall. He surveyed what needed to be done. He came up with a game plan. He knew he just couldn't just show up and start piling up rocks because it would never work. So, so he went out and surveyed, and, and, he, and he took the time to, to see what needed to be done. Um, he knew he just couldn't just show up and, and expect everyone to be on board without a plan. When God gives us something to do, uh, we, do we can't expect people just to, to say, all right, let's go do it, you know, without, without laying a vision, laying a plan on what we need to do. We have to give them a clear, a clear plan to accomplish uh, that, that thing that God has put in our hearts. So we have to begin with prayer. Uh, we have to have a plan, and then the third, and then and only then can we push forward to accomplish what God has called us to do. And, and 
again, that's exactly what Nehemiah did. He prayed continually. Uh, he saw what needed to be done, and he came up with a game plan. And then we see him push that plan into action in, in Nehemiah 2, 17 and 18. Uh, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and it will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start building. So they began this good work. So after, after Nehemiah prayed, after he planned, the people were able to see that vision that Nehemiah had for the wall. And it wasn't just a few people that got on board. It was everyone. Everyone was excited, from, from priests to peasants, young and old, uh, men and women, rich and poor. They all worked together. Everyone had a job to do. They all knew what they were supposed to be doing. They all knew what part of the wall that they were supposed to be building. They didn't just go running around just throwing rocks here and there. They knew that they had a specific job to do. It was, it was truly a team effort. And really, this is a beautiful picture of how ministry should operate. All of us working together. When God gives us a job to do, we, we pray and we plan, and then we work together to accomplish that goal as we push forward. All of us, men and women, young and old, pastors and Sunday school teachers, piano players and custodians and, and middle-aged families, middle-aged people and kids and everybody. It takes all of us working together to, for one goal. When the people heard Nehemiah's plan, uh, they pushed forward, and the impossible quickly became possible. Think, think about this. This group of exiles, uh, like we said, priests, peasants, men, women, children, uh, all working together to rebuild this, the, the entire wall, really, around Jerusalem. And it, and it really wasn't a little wall. If, if you look at the wall, um, they, they think it was about over 8 feet thick, at least 8 feet thick. Um, it was almost 40 feet tall, and it was 2 and a half miles long. That's a big wall. And it was accomplished in 52 days by a bunch of amateurs that prayed and had a plan to push forward. 52 days in, in less than two months. And, and the thing that blows me away, this is actually pictures of Nehemiah's wall. 25 years, 2,500 years later, it's still standing. Now, parts of those have been added on and built on the part with the moss. On the, on the left, uh, that, that was a, a different tower that they built. But the one in the background, um, you can see the lady standing in the top right corner of the picture on the left to show how, how big the wall was. Um, but that, that amazes me. 2,500 years later, the wall is still standing because Nehemiah prayed and he had a plan. And he, put, and he pushed forward in his vision. This wall was built by men and women and children of all ages, all professions, all classes. But the thing was that they were working working for one common goal. So what, what I want us to think about today, what could God do through us as we stand together? And, and really, uh, this is one of the most amazing churches that I've ever seen. I mean, you guys are awesome. You guys are unbelievable. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think there's not a doubt that we work together as one. We, we love each other. Um, yes, we may have disagreements. We may have conflict a little bit, but, but we still support one another. We still stand beside one another. And God has used us to do great things, really, in this community and, and around the world on our mission trips. And, and uh, I mean, and God's still using us to do great things. Um, so, so I think we're not, you know, this isn't like a foreign concept to us. You, we know, you guys know what you're doing. Um, and I just happen to come in at a good time. <laughs> because you guys already know what you're doing. Um, and God has used us to do great things. But, but the thing I want us to think about is, is that, that we can never just relax and sit back and look at those things we've already done. And yes, those are nice, and we've done great things, but I believe there's more that God wants us to do. I believe there's a bigger picture. There's, uh, you know, I, I believe that, that the best days of our church are to come. I think the things that we've done are awesome, and, and the way we've, we've worked together is awesome, but I think there's even more that God wants us to keep, continue to do. And, and I believe they're, they're big things and, and things that look impossible to us. Um, so we have to continue to pray and plan and push forward together. And see what God wants us to do. I, I hope that we're never satisfied with, with what's already been done. But that we're continually moving forward. We're continually praying and planning and pushing forward. Because that's what God's plan is for us. This church has shown the light of Christ in this community for a long time. I think almost, we're coming up on 200 years, right? I think somebody told me 1823 it was established. Out in the byways of the cornfields. Before it was moved here. Is that right? Does anybody know that? I believe it was 
believe it was 1823. Um, so 2023, we'll be here 200 years. That's amazing. And, and, uh, and that's awesome. But, but the question is, what can we do now? What can we do tomorrow? What can we do next week? What can we do in the future to, to, to make sure that in 200 more years, people can look back and see what we did and think, man, I want to do that. I want to keep going forward. That's what our plan is. What does God want us to do? What does he want us to do to advance his kingdom? And that's the question we need to look at. The focus all starts with our broken heart. What breaks our heart? Because that's where we're going to put our time. That's where we're going to put our ministry. I pray that our hearts would always break for the same things that make God's heart break. I pray that, that the very thought of sin would break our hearts. I pray that, the, that even the idea of grieving the Holy, Holy Spirit would, would cause us to examine our hearts and, and make sure our lives line up with his word. And I, I challenge you today to find something that breaks God's heart so that, and let it break yours. I challenge you today to, to pray about those things and seek God to see what kind of plan that, that we need to put in place so we can push forward and advance the kingdom of God in our communities and in our world. And I bless you to know this morning that the impossible will always be possible if we work together for one goal and one plan. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that, that, uh, that you recorded these things in your scripture. God, that, that we can look back and see, Father, what you did, God, so that it would encourage us to go and do new things for you. And Lord, like I said, I, I, we've done great things as a church. God, this, this church that has shown a, a light in your darkness for a long time, Father, in this dark world. And they've made an impact around the world, Father. But I pray, God, that we would never settle for what's been done, Lord. I pray, God, that we would always be looking to move forward, to push, to, to pray and plan and, and push forward into what you want us to do next. God, I thank you for that. I pray, God, that you would just bring us uh, even a new special closeness than, than we've ever had, Lord. God, that we would stand beside one another. God, and lift one another up. We love you so much, God. We thank you, God, that you've given us an example of what you want us to do. And I pray, God, that you would just set this in our hearts today. God, you are awesome and you are worthy. And we thank you, Lord, that you have even considered us, Father, to be your hands and feet in this world. We pray all this and ask it in your holy name. Amen. Would you please stand as we close in worship?
patient of days, you're the shepherd of our hearts. You know, Richard, I'm hot. You're the God who keeps his covenant love with those who love him and obey him. Lord, you show us how to do that. walk up in the pews, even now on the spot. Is there someone here who needs to give you their heart, Lord? I pray they'd say yes today because they may not have any other way of presenting it. Is someone struggling? Jesus. 